for humanity. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته We move on to a new chapter in our series on عمدة الأحكام This chapter deals with الجهاد and this topic, the minute people hear al-jihad, they're going to turn off the television sets. And those who are sitting, they probably mask themselves, not being associated with this beautiful and noble ritual, al-jihad. It is part of our deen. It is part of our Islam. Yet there are a lot of controversial issues surrounding this beautiful ritual and a lot of misconceptions. Therefore, you cannot judge something until you study it, until you take it from the sources. And without that, you would be taking the wrong idea and having the wrong conclusions. So what is jihad? Jihad, to begin with, is to struggle and it is not only limited to killing and fighting. We have jihad of shaitan. We have jihad of our own selves. We have the jihad against the hypocrites. We have the jihad against the sinners, Muslims, but the sinners. And we have the jihad against the disbelievers. So there are five types of jihad, and each one has its weapons and arms and different types of capabilities. So we do jihad with the soul by struggling, by forcing ourselves to worship Allah and to stay away from haram. This is the type of jihad that we need. We have to learn about Islam so that we make jihad against the doubts that come to us. Without having knowledge, shaitan plays with us like a football. Therefore, we need knowledge to be able to refute and deflect his doubts and his bad thoughts. We need jihad with the hypocrites who claim to be Muslims and they're not. And they're undermining Islam from beneath. So how to make jihad with them? With force? No with knowledge. So when they say something, we say Quran and Sunnah say against that. And this is the type of weaponry to be used with the hypocrites and so on. Now, what we care about is jihad against the disbelievers. Is Islam considered to be a violent religion? No. And we can prove that, but we need a lot of more lectures about that. What do you say about the accusation that Islam was spread by the sword? Again, this is false. If you look at the history of Islam, you will find that force was not used all the time, but it was used. And there has to be force used in most of the things that we do. So this is not our topic. Our topic is, what is the jihad that is mentioned in the Quran? There are two types of jihad, offensive and defensive. The defensive side, we will talk, inshallah, throughout these hadiths we're going through. The offensive side, this can only be applied when the Muslim country or the Muslim nation, it has its sovereignty, its power, its army, 
and they're practicing. A Muslim country that is not practicing cannot make jihad for the cause of Allah. Because what is the intention of jihad? What is the cause and the soul of jihad? It is to invite people to Islam. But there is no compulsion in deen, right? There is no compulsion in religion. So why are you attacking us? We are not attacking you. We are simply there to deliver the message of Islam. Okay, you delivered the message of Islam. Bye-bye. No, the land is not yours. The land is Allah's. So, in this case, either accept Islam, we'll leave you alone. If you don't want to accept Islam, no problem. Pay the jizya, the taxation. We will defend you, we will take care of you, but this money has to be paid because you're living on Allah's land. This taxation for us to guard you and protect you against any assault, yet at the same time, we, and it's a minimal fee, yet at the same time, this is considered to be an Islamic territory. If you refuse, then we will fight you, one of the three. But this, is it applicable now? The Muslim countries themselves need to have some kind of liberation because the people are not worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. They're not applying the Quran and Sunnah in their lives, in their rulings, in their economy, in their politics. They're so, so far away to the extent that they're humiliated as Muslim nations or Muslim countries. So this is the offensive jihad. The defensive jihad is when the enemy attacks you. What to do? Now, in order not to be classified as a terrorist to them, the right thing to do is just sit there, watch them invade your country, killing your men, raping your women, and taking your children as captive. Otherwise, if you defend yourself, if you defend your honor, then you're considered to be a terrorist. And this is the colonial powers, those who invaded the Muslim countries and invaded 50 or 70 or 100 years ago, this is their mentality, that the Muslims are there only to serve us. That is why two soldiers were talking over lunch, and they were saying that these Africans, when they invaded them, these Africans are barbaric. And the other man says, yes, I agree. Why? He said, imagine I was executing this African man because he did a crime, and this savage, barbaric person bit my hand. This is why he's barbaric, you're killing him. And you want him to give you a kiss and say, thank you for killing me, your highness. What do you expect him to do? So no, no, he's barbaric, he bit my hand. So this is the mentality of colonial powers that only take the fruit and the goodness of the land and leave the people to die or to perish. This is not their problem. Defensive jihad is something that is mandatory upon the country or the city that is being invaded. And jihad is mandatory in four cases, as the scholars say. But first of all, what is the ruling on jihad? Is it mandatory, meaning on every individual, or is it fard kifaya, communal obligation, that if some do it, then the rest are exempted? The most authentic opinion is, that it is communal obligation, fard kifaya. It is not mandatory upon every single individual, except in four cases. What are these four cases? One, when the armies meet, and you're among them. So if you are with the Muslim army, and the enemy army comes and approaches, it is mandatory upon you to fight. You cannot say, oops, um, I have to go. I have an important appointment. The dentist. I have a one month old appointment with the dentist. No, you must fight. And you cannot run away because one of the seven major sins in Islam is to run away when the armies meet. This is extremely major and dangerous sin in Islam. Unless you are using war tactics. So I cannot run away Yes, but if I am running away so that he would follow me, and all of a sudden, I would face him and kill him. This is halal. Or if I'm running away so that I can join another army 
so that we become more stronger to attack, again, this is halal. But if you're running away because I have nothing to do here, man, I'm going, I'm gone. No, this is a major sin. So number one, it's mandatory to fight when? When the two armies meet. Number two, it is mandatory for you to fight when the enemy enters your city or town or invades your country. It becomes mandatory to fight. You cannot run away. What about the percentage? If there are so many of them? Well, in part one, when the armies are meeting, and this is not defensive, this is offensive jihad. When the armies are meeting, if they are more than double the size of our army, we have the permission not to fight, not to engage. In the beginning of Islam, as mentioned in Surat Al-Anfal, chapter 8, at the very end. In the beginning, it was mandatory upon every Muslim to fight 10 times as big. So a warrior, if faced with 10, he has to fight them. If faced by 11, he has an excuse to leave or run away. And this was the case. They used to fight, but then it was hard on them. So Allah abrogated it because he saw the weakness, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knew the weakness and wanted to have mercy on them and made it one, two, two. Meaning if there's a warrior and two enemy fighters, he has to fight them till the death. If there are more, he has an excuse. But this doesn't mean that he does not or he cannot stand in the face of more than two. This means that he has the cues to go, but if he wants to fight 10, he can fight 10. And this is what happened with the Muslims in, for example, Badr, 300 plus, and the Mushrik were 1,000 plus. And in Uhud as well, the ratio was very little. In Mu'tah, there were 3,000 of them and 200,000 of the Byzantines and the Romans. There's much, much difference. So they had the excuse not to fight, but they still fought and they are rewarded for doing this. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. The world is passing by an educational crisis. A selfish and aimless education. Education has been mainly limited to the material sides of it. An ineffective and incomplete education system. Because without teaching who they are, who has created them, and sent them into this world. In lust for greed education. The only system of education that can give. The complete system of education is the glorious Quran. This guidance, the Islamic system of education. To understand the correct purpose of education, join Dr. Zaglul An Najjar in Islam and Education every Tuesday at 4 p.m. and repeat telecast at 2:30 a.m. India on Peace TV. The Voice of Truth. That Allah does not look at your face, but rather Allah looks at your heart and looks at your action. We Muslims know life is a test. And so in order for us to have peace, there must be standards, there must be proof. The Voice of Justice. Indeed, to all nation we send a messenger that they will call people to worship one God, Allah. The one who is the only one who can grant true peace. That we are looking for. The voice of peace. The last and final instruction manual for the human being, it is the glorious Quran. The, glorious Quran. the voice standing up for all of humanity against all falsehood. Islamic voice, next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. So this is the ratio in offensive, one to two. In the defensive jihad, you have no right to run. You have to fight till the death. If an army invades your country or invades 
your town, you have to fight till the death. You cannot say, I am one and there are a thousand. Fight until you die. Even if they all die, no problem. Dying in battle, defending your honor, defending your religion, defending your country is better than being humiliated and captive and being a prisoner of war. So fight till the death. Now, this is number one, when two armies meet. Number two, when your country or city is being invaded and attacked by the disbelievers. Number three is when the Imam tells you to fight. And the Prophet says, If the Imam, if the ruler tells you we have to fight, then you have to fight. You cannot say, but I have an appointment, I have this or that. You have to comply. And what is meant by the Imam? The Imam is the ruler, the Muslim ruler, whether he is black or white, whether he is rich or poor. As long as he is the Muslim ruler and he rules the country you are in, then you have to obey him. And this also brings us to the issue of Khilafah. We have people always calling, we have to have Khilafah, 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 and they only sing about Khilafah and have nothing to do with the deen except Khilafah. Overthrow governments, bring this, bring that, and this is not Islam. Islam does not only focus on Khilafah. Islam focuses on everything. But nowadays, to highlight this issue only, is it applicable? No, it's not at the moment. It will be, yes. But when can it be implemented? When all the Muslims become true practicing Muslims. Look at Muslim countries. They have so many rulers. Each country has a ruler. We say we don't obey any of them and we do not give the Pledge of Allegiance to any of them until we have one Imam or one Khalifa. This is not applicable. The Muslims themselves in one country are unable to choose one of them to rule them or to have peace and harmony and tranquility in their country. How do you want all these different Muslim countries to vote for one Khalifa? This is not applicable at the moment. So each country has its ruler. Now, providing he is a Muslim, he does not nullify his Islam, he does not do things of kufr. So if this Muslim ruler says that you have to fight, then it becomes what? Mandatory upon you. The fourth condition or situation that it becomes mandatory for you to perform jihad is when you have something and Muslims need it. For example, if you are an expert in flying an F-15 and there are no Muslims to fly this aircraft, then it becomes mandatory upon you. No one would say, um, sorry, look for someone else or hire someone. Look into the classified and get someone to fly your airplane or to operate your tank. No it becomes mandatory upon you. This is the four situations when it becomes mandatory. Other than that, it is what? It is communal obligation, fard kifaya, not mandatory upon every person. Okay, we take the hadith number 401. Narrated Abdullah bin Abu Awfa that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, in one of those days when he was confronting the enemies, waited until the sun has declined. Then he stood up to address the people and said, O oh people, do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. Pray to Allah that he grant you al-afiya, the security. But if you encounter them, exercise patience, and you should know that the paradise is under the shadow of the sword. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa said, O oh Allah, reviler of books, despiser of the cloud, defeater of the hordes, defeat our enemy and grant us victory over them. Okay, this long hadith is also full of beautiful lessons that we can learn. However, we begin from the very beginning. The Prophet ﷺ waited until the sun has declined, meaning that this is the best time to fight when it's noon time or after Salat al-Dhuhr then the breeze is suitable, the visibility is suitable. And also if one fights after Fajr as well, this is a long time 
for fighting before Salat. It's suitable. And then the Prophet ﷺ reminded them. And he said, O oh people, do not hope or do not wish for an encounter with the enemy. Why is that? Because nothing is equivalent to al-afiyah. What is al-afiyah? Al-afiyah is security in this life and also security from sin and security from tribulation and testing. So al-afiyah can be a general word that means everything that is good for you. So the Prophet is telling us, والسلام, first of all, do not wish to meet or to encounter your enemy. Sometimes a person feels strong feelings of Iman. Oh Allah, let me fight in your cause. Oh Allah, let me do this, let me do that. Once the fighting starts and the battle is going and taking place and the bullets are flying and the bombs are exploding, then he goes back to his nature of being afraid and why me? And then thinking of running away. So the Prophet is saying, I said, no, don't test Allah Azza wa Jal. Don't put yourself in a place where you would discover, but in a hard way, that you were not ready for that. So don't be egomaniac. Don't think of yourself about yourself in a good way, in the sense that, yes, I can do this, I can do that. And ask Allah Azza wa for al -afiyah. Ask Allah for security in all of your affairs. But if you happen to meet, this is the inevitable. I'm not asking, oh Allah, let me meet the kuffar and fight. This is different than wanting to fight in the cause of Allah. Wanting to fight in the cause of Allah is a sign of Iman. And not wanting to fight in the cause of Allah is a sign of hypocrisy, as in the Sahih Muslim. This is different because you want to fight for the cause of Allah, but not, oh Allah, let me meet them. Send me someone that is strong and I will exchange blows and I will kill him. Don't be so sure of yourself. Have the intention to fight, but don't be thinking too much of yourself because then this means that you're depending on yourself. However, if you meet the enemies, this is inevitable, then you must be patient. Be steadfast. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make you capable of fighting them. And the Prophet said, and know and acknowledge that paradise is in the shade of swords. What is meant by this? When people fight, what will they do? This or this? They will do this, fighting each other. So when he does this with his sword and you do this with your sword, who's underneath? The fighters. So the Prophet is telling us, السلام, when the combat takes place, then paradise is under the shade of swords, meaning for those fighting for the cause of Allah Azza wa Jal. And then the Prophet السلام, supplicated. And we know that the best and strongest and most effective weapon in jihad is dua, supplicating. And that is why on the eve of Badr, when everybody was asleep, ready to fight in the following morning, enemy troops, the Muslim troops, the Prophet did not sleep, as well. In his tent, he kept on raising his hands, standing in prayer and saying, Oh Allah, fulfill your promise. Oh Allah, if these people die, 